um, um, it gives me now great pleasure to invite um, Christa Janssen um, to give us a clinical perspective. He's Professor of Respiratory Medicine and Allergology at the Department of Medical Sciences in Uppsala in Sweden. Um, over 600 original research papers. You were in the EU Commission last week talking about this topic to, 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 to ministers. Um, 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 and you are the president of the Swedish Association for Allergology, and also you were the former head of the European Respiratory Society um, Epidemiology and Environment Assembly. Um, and Christy, you're going to tell us about carbon footprint impact on inhalers and probably pick up on some of the questions that were asked earlier. Thanks. Okay, thank you. It, it's uh, f fantastic being here at this uh, symposium and in this wonderful city. So I, I will talk perhaps, you will see some repetition, but maybe my talk will be a little more clinical based. We'll see. So here are my disclosures. And uh, here is some historical uh, pictures of the ozone hole uh, during 1980 to 1991. And um, what we found out eventually was that this was to a large extent related to the use of CFCs. And as you know, CFCs was the propellant used in MDIs uh, before. And um, was that this important? Well, this was the comment uh, I heard when I was at some at a inhalation device meeting in um, uh, Madeira, 1990, and uh, it was a British doctor saying that, uh, who cares that a few penguins get sunburned? And perhaps that has biased my views on uh, the environmental um, criticisms or skepticism in the UK. I'm sure that's very unfair. Anyway, what happened was the Montreal Protocol, and um, instead of CFC uh, inhalators, we, we got other options. And um, you, we have the hydrofluorocarbon uh, as a propellant for the MDIs. We have the soft mist inhalers, and we have the dry powder inhalers. But there's one thing I think that they should look at, and that is the year you see for the CFC uh, MDI. It took until 2013 before the last CFC propellant inhaler was produced, before that this was stopped. So it takes time to change things. And as you heard from the previous talks, we don't have a lot of time here. So that's really a problem. So what can we do about this? Now, the HFC uh, MDIs, well, they are an advantage uh, to many, uh, in many ways. I mean, they don't have the ozone depletion effects of CFC, so that's good. We don't have the problem with the ozone hole to the same extent. But there is another problem that people weren't really aware of at that time, and that is, of course, the uh, greenhouse uh, <clears throat> warming potential of uh, HFCs. You can see that it's lower than in um, uh, the um, CFCs, but it's still 1,400 times higher than CO2. So, uh, and then we have to talk about, is this really important or not? One thing that's fascinating to me, and you've seen this uh, picture before, Frederica showed it, uh, but there's one aspect that I want you to look at, and that's uh, the use of PMDIs in the UK, and the use of PMDIs and DPIs in my own country, in Sweden, you can see that there's a fundamental difference. And of course, it would be wonderful to say as a Swede, that's because we're so conscious of the environment and we knew that this would happen, the um, carbon footprint and so on, but of course that's not true. We had no idea about that when this happened. So the real reason for this was probably the very dominating um, influence of AstraZeneca uh, at that time of the transition and a movement from the PMDIs to different DPIs and especially I think the turbohaler. And I'm sure most of you are fluent in Swedish, but if you're not, you can see here that the turbohaler is by now the most popular uh, inhaler in Sweden. So let's talk about the propellant and you already know about this, you heard this in, in John's talk. Uh, the problem we have is that the propellants we are using, they have quite a large carbon footprint effect. 
1,300 to 1,400 times higher uh, than CO2 if we look at HFA 134, depending on how you calculate things, and even higher for uh, HFA 227. So how much does this matter? And we tried to do some calculations uh, in a paper published in Thorax, where we looked at um, a regular patient using reliever therapy and using some, and also using maintenance treatment. And if this was based on uh, PMDIs purely, or, and compare that with uh, treatment based on um, uh, DPIs purely. And what we saw was that the carbon footprints were 20 times higher if you were using um, MDI-based treatment compared to a DPI-based treatment. And then we tried to put it in some kind of perspective. And uh, what we found was that this, for an individual patient, was almost of the same magnitude as the difference between eating a vegan diet or a meat-based diet, or moving, switching from a uh, a gasoline car to an um, um, electric car. And of course, it's important to know that this is not only true for DPIs. If you compare soft mist inhalers uh, with PMDIs, you see the same kind of magnitude of difference. So looking at it from a carbon footprint perspective, uh, I don't think there's any question that uh, DPIs and uh, soft mist inhalers are better. But then, of course, we have to look at it from a more global perspective. And this is some calculations uh, shown at a fairly recent uh, review paper in the European Respiratory Journal uh, with uh, Ashley Woodcock as, as the first author. And, um, well, the National Health Service in the UK, they, as many others, they aim to be carbon neutral uh, by the year of 2045. And uh, what they saw that, that the use of PMDIs represented about 30% of the NHA's carbon emission related to delivery of care and 3% of NHA's carbon emission. And this was the same kind of carbon footprints you get from all the electricity produced needed uh, for the NHA's, NHS. So, I mean, it's not, the, it's not saving the whole world, but it's something at least. So what can we do? What strategies can we have for reducing the environmental impact of inhalation therapy? Well, one possibility, and we have talked a little bit about it, is replacing PMDIs with uh, DPIs uh, in ICS and ICS larva maintenance treatment, or even triple treatment, of course. So are there problems with that? Well, of course there are. So the way you use PMDIs and DPIs are different. For a PMDI, you should inhale slowly. For a DPI, inhale quickly. Um, DPIs have an advantage when it comes to coordination. You don't need that to the same extent. Whereas uh, when it comes to the need for a rapid enough inspiratory flow, that's a problem with the DPI, but not with the PMDI. Nevertheless, we, I think we were able to show that this is possible by doing an uh, ad hoc analysis of a pragmatic trial made by GSK uh, several years ago, uh, the so-called Salford asthma trial. And uh, when we analyzed that data, we were able to show that those patients that were switched from PMDIs to a DPI, in this case for Elevar, uh, without losing asthma control, actually they had better asthma control using uh, the DPI than using the PMDI. We, can, we were able to show that there was a quite a large difference when it came to carbon footprints. So I think this shows that, at least in some setting, it's possible to switch patients from PMDIs to DPIs without losing asthma control. Now, another thing that we could do is perhaps uh, replace PMDIs uh, with DPIs or Saba reliever therapy. You heard before, and I will show you that again, that the carbon footprints of Saba is uh, what really dominates uh, when it comes to the carbon footprints of inhaled treatment. And uh, the same study that I talked about before in, in thorax, we looked at sales of inhalers in England and in, in Sweden. And one thing that really fascinated me was that when it came to short-acne beta-2 agonists, 94% 
of all the inhalers sold in England were uh, PMDIs, and in Sweden it was only 10%, the rest was DPIs. So very, very large difference. So in, in England, no patient can consider using anything else than a PMDI for reliever therapy, and in my country it's absolutely the opposite. So reliever therapy for asthma in the UK and in Sweden looks like this. PMDI in the UK and uh, uh, DPI in Sweden. And we don't have any kind of evidence that asthma control uh, should be less in, in my country than in the UK. Perhaps there are some data showing the opposite. And what would that mean? Well, we calculated that in England, the same rate of MDI use as in Sweden would mean uh, um, <clears throat> having 550 geotons CO2 equivalents uh, that would be saved uh, annually. And that would correspond to about 3% of the total carbon footprints of the NHS in England. Now, another thing that we could do is to try to reduce the need for uh, short-acting beta 2 agonists by improving asthma control. Now, why is that important? So this is a paper uh, published recently in the European Respiratory Journal. <clears throat> and what we found was when we compared the carbon footprints of different kinds of inhaled therapy, we found that two-thirds of it was related to SABA use and one-third, of course, to maintenance treatment. Um, in total, this is quite a large number. So it was uh, uh, CO2 equivalents of corresponding to 1.5 million gasoline cars per year. Uh, but of course, this means that if we can reduce the use of SABA, this will have a large effect on carbon footprints. We also know that overuse of SABA is quite common in many countries. Here's some data from Spain, Sweden, and the UK showing that at least one third of our patients are overusing SABA. So something is, is wrong here. And we were able to show in the same data that the majority of um, the SABA use related to carbon footprints was actually coming from these patients that were overusing SABA. So we, we can target that asthma population. There are large carbon footprint savings potential. And we also, in, in a, another paper, showed that having an overusing SABA is, is really related to a bad prognosis when it comes to asthma. Looking at the years after we did the monitoring, we found that those overusing SABA had a much to much higher extent uh, asthma exacerbations and it was even related to asthma mortality. And also, which has been talked about here, something that really causes a lot of carbon footprints is treating patients with asthma attacks. And the more severe the exacerbations are, the more severe the asthma attacks. So reducing SABA use and getting better asthma control is really a way forward if we want to decrease the carbon footprints of inhalation therapy. So another possibility related to this is uh, to reduce the need for SABA in asthma management by using ICS formoterol uh, given by DPI in the reliever uh, treatment. And of course, this is very much related to the uh, GINA guidelines of 2019, and this is the 2022 version. And if you look at the top, you see the preferred track, and you can see that in this track, all the SABA use is replaced by ICS formatrol use. And this will potentially lead to better asthma control, but it will also lead to uh, a large gains, at least um, theoretically, in carbon footprints. And this is from a um, presentation at the uh, ERS conference this year, and where you can look at the CO2 equivalents carbon footprints um, using the regular uh, MDIs with a SABA, 242 kilos. Uh, if you instead you use the, the MART uh, alternative, you replace the SABA with um, uh, ICS formaterol using a PMDIs, you half the carbon footprints, but you get an even much better effect if instead of uh, PMDIs you're using a DPI. So here there is a large um, potential for saving carbon footprints. So 
possible strategies for reducing the environmental impact of inhalation therapy, replacing PMDIs with DPIs in ICS and ICS lava methane treatment, like in the Salford study, uh, replacing PMDIs with DPIs in Saba reliever treatment, going from the UK way of handling reliever therapy to the Swedish way, or reduce the need for Saba by improving asthma control, or reduce the need for Saba in asthma management by ICS formatrol, preferably given by a DPI in reliever uh, treatment, like the gene alternative. But still, as you all know, it's not, it will not be possible to replace all PMDIs. Uh, there are groups of uh, patients where PMDIs really is the only option. We have it in children, we, we can't use a DPI. We have a, it in elderly patients where many of them can't get the inspiratory flow needed to use a DPI. We have it in emergency settings where the best treatment we have is uh, asthma reliever therapy with a um, PMDI and a spacer. And uh, then, as we have talked about before, we have the problem in low and middle income countries which there really aren't any affordable DPIs available. So uh, we have this um, um, positive um, development now of uh, getting new kinds of propellants. And uh, we've talked about them before, and I think one important aspect is also to see that the half-life of these new propellants is much uh, shorter than the propellants we have right now. So there is a large potential here. Now, why is this so critical? Well, the reason, we have talked about this before, the Kigali Amendment saying that we should phase out the kind of HFCs we're using now because they are powerful greenhouse gases. And um, one of the driving forces here is the, uh, this kind of calculations saying that, okay, maybe they are not so important right now, but if nothing is done, it will have a very large effect on, on uh, our climate and may lead to an increase of the surface temperature of up to 0.5 degrees Celsius. Now, this, of course, has led to the EU regulations, which has been the suggestion to modify them in a way that John talked about before. And that gets us into this critical um, time problem that we have right now. So this is uh, another picture from uh, ERS uh, con Symposium we had this year. And this looks at the F-gas regulations and the timing for them. The draft of the legislation published, the ratification, and um, what we get to by 2027 and onwards is the potential of a significant shortfall in PMDI availability. So this is important. I, I think it's important to stress out that the PMDIs we have now is a problem from a climate perspective, but at the same time, our patients, many of our patients, still need this treatment, and we have to see that it's available even after 2027. So my summary would be that uh, there are large geographical differences in the use of inhalers, and especially between uh, the United Kingdom and, and my own country, Sweden. The PMDIs have a much larger carbon footprint than DPIs or soft mist inhalers. That reducing the number of asthma exacerbations has a large effect on carbon footprints. Reducing the use of HFC is important from a global climate perspective. More climate-friendly propellants are being developed, but they're still not on the market. And because of this, timing is critical when facing out HFCs in order to avoid a shortage of PMDIs for asthma and COPD patients. Thank you. Krista, thank you um, really um, for a very um, nice um, balanced presentation. Um, we have a question over there. Sorry, hopefully my last question. Um, I noticed that you talk about uh, DPIs. Sorry, I'm over here. <laughs> Um, as well as, um, uh, and then PMDIs in, in, in um, relation to um, making global change. Uh, the turbohaler uses pure drug. It's only micronized powder. 
and a lot of DPIs use a um, uh, lactose-based system with uh, a micronized powder. Mm -hmm. uh, I've developed a few in my time. And do you think that all DPIs are the same in terms of being able to deliver to the uh, to the lung for a lever medication, or do you think that uh, only the turbohaler can do it? <laughs> no, I, I don't She's think Swedish. only the turbohaler can do it. And if you look at my picture, you show, I, I showed you three different inhalers, uh, the discus uh, and the isohaler and the turbohaler. Um, I mean, there are differences, of course, between uh, the different kinds of DPIs and especially how easy it is to use them. Uh, there are differences also if you look at the uh, particle size, but I think from a clinical perspective, I think they are fairly similar, at least if we look at uh, different kinds of uh, short-acting beta-2 agonists. Thank you. Um, so we've got several questions on Slido, um, so I'll try and summarize them. So, um, uh, um, Krista, um, taking a step back, and this session is planetary health, what about the impact of dry powder inhalers on plastics? The plastic mountain. I think that's what they're trying to ask. Well, uh, that's an excellent question. I mean, that's the usual answer you have when you haven't thought about the problem. But, <laughs> but uh, don't you have the same kind of problem with PMDIs? So, um, so we may be thinking about, um, you know, change is in the air, as we asked John to speak about. But are we causing a problem? in the seas beneath our feet in 20, 30 years time. Yeah. When plastic mountain bags are now 30 pence in the UK, straws are being removed, single use plastic cutlery, and doctors are being incentivized to switch patients from MDIs to DPIs without seeing the patient. And what we're seeing in the UK now is patients are being admitted to casualty and that one admission by driving their car or getting into an ambulance if they can, um, uh, and that admission to hospital just obliterates any change in saving the environment from an MDI to an MDI. Yeah, uh, but, but that's true. I mean, we, we don't want forced switching. If you switch a patient from one inhaler device to another one, you have to train them to, to use it. I found that out in my hotel today. I had this can of water that I wanted to use. Yeah, they're quite uh, difficult. Yeah, they? and it was very high tech, and it took me like uh, 10 minutes before I knew how to open it. And uh, I mean, that's an easy device compared to an inhalation device. So, so you really have to train your patients. And, and that, of course, is a cost that you have to take into consideration. So, right, the last question um, over that. Go for it. Uh, hi, Hardik Shah, Covis Pharma. Very quickly, oh, here, John, thanks. Up there. <laughs> Thank the you. lights are really bad here. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Uh, how about the patient's perspective? You gave good analogy about the electric car and the diesel car, and we all made personal choices in our daily life, where we want to go, how much distance we want to travel. Physician perspective we hear on the stage. Does the patients come back with the uh, understanding what's going on day to day, that they want to switch to the greener therapy or the DPI? Do they bring back? Any questions or challenge back to the physicians? Question for Omar as well, just any experience. Mm. No, but I think that that's a really important question. And I, I must say that, at least in my country, the patient's awareness of the environmental difference between different kinds of inhalers isn't that large. And it's not something I really have talked about because there's also the other problem. You don't want to make patients um, using a certain kind of device, feeling that they're spoiling the environment. So I think it's a tricky thing. Uh, when I talk about DPIs and that they may, might be favorable compared to PMDIs in some perspectives, it's more, tar my target is, is healthcare professions, not uh, patients, but we'll see what happens in the future. We've got super, uh, lots of questions coming through and I appreciate we've got questions in the audience, um, but in the interest of time, um, um, Krista, thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> so, having me here. So, really, um, thank you all. Thanks to John for changes in the air. Then Daniel talking about uh, the valve and the formulation. Krista, yourself on the clinical perspective. Um, that closes this session on planetary health. Can I ask now all the 
authors of the posters to be at the posters as the DDL committee will be coming around and we will be making a decision on which is the best industry and which is the best academic poster. Um, so grab a coffee and then manual posters and we'll be around and see you shortly. Do all return now for lung diseases at 4.35 um, when we've got a smashing session there. Thank you all. <laughs>